Baroness Deitch. My Lords, I beg leave to ask the question standing in my name on the order paper. My Lords, in the last 20 years, the percentage of women in your Lordship's House has increased from 17 per cent to 26.5 per cent. In this Parliament, seven of the 17 party political appointments were women. The Prime Minister considers factors including skills, expertise, party political balance and diversity. Progress has been made, but there is still more to be done. <laughs> there is much to be said on this question, as the Minister has said, but I want to focus on just one issue. As long as we have seats for hereditary peers, women continue to be ineligible for almost all of them. Succession to the Crown has been changed to allow women to succeed equally. We even have women bishops. <laughs> to add to the unfairness, eldest daughters are even specifically forbidden to change sex for the purposes of succession <laughs> under the 2004 Gender Recognition Act. Will the government back the simple bill put forward by Philip Davis MP to remove all remaining obstacles to equality and allow daughters to seek seats here. Our composition should be based on equality and fairness. We have to set an example. Saying it's complicated is no answer to such a question. So we must end the inherent androcentric nature of this House. Uh, my Lords, I understand the noble lady's wish to remove the barrier to women entering your Lordship's House via the hereditary by-election principle by allowing the title to pass to the eldest child. Um, I believe there are better ways to reduce the current imbalance. That The noble lady's solution involves first getting primary legislation through this House uh, on the right of succession, and the noble Lord Graycott will tell the noble lady <laughs> just how difficult it is to get legislation through this House that tampers with the hereditary principle. Secondly, it would then depend on a marked increase in the mortality of hereditary peers, <laughs> something, something which I know the noble lady does not want. And then thirdly, it would depend on the women then winning the, 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 the by-elections. I honestly think it is better to make progress and get more women in your Lordship's House by continuing to drive up the percentage of life peerages than by going round the course that I've just enunciated. The noble Lord... The noble Lord... The I can persuade my noble friend and the Minister to support my private member's bill, which arranges for hereditary peerages to go through the female line in certain circumstances. Well, uh, I understand that my noble friend has been round this course uh, before, and uh, he submitted a bill in 2015-16, 2016-17, and in the current session. Uh, the main purpose appeared to be reviving and maintaining peerages rather than pursuing female succession as an end in itself. The bill received a second reading in the 2015-16 session, but did not in the 16-17 session or the current session. Lords, like every woman bar, or bar one, who I pay great tribute to, but on behalf of every other woman in this House, we want to be here on the basis of our own skills, our own experience, our own political and non-political background. We do not want to be here because of our fathers, our grandfathers, our great-grandfathers and wonderful people we've had before us. So could the noble Lord, the Minister, undertake, and I know he tries, to continue with his party uh, to try and move Lord Grocott's bill on. But in the meantime, could he also ensure that everything that the government does in its advice to the Appointments Committee, as well as the political peerages, do indeed move two to one in the favour of women? Yeah, 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 yeah. On, on the issue of the noble Lord, Lord Grocott's bill, it's had more time than any other private member's bill this session, and many of us have spent enjoyable Fridays making progress. It is open to the noble lord, if his appetite is unquenched, to ask my noble friend, the Chief Whip, for yet more time to progress with his bill. Um, on, um, on, the, on the question of, of, of HOLAC, um, I know the current chair, Lord Bew, takes this uh, seriously. Uh, since 2012, HOLAC have appointed seven women and five men. Oh, 
My Lords, we will hear from the Liberal Democrats and then we will hear from the Noble Lord. Thank you. Um, my Lords, I'd like to remind the House that I'm a member of the House of Lords Appointments Commission. Uh, I'm grateful that the Noble Lord has highlighted that since 2012 we've appointed seven women and five men. Um, but is he aware that only 27.8% of the applicants to HOLAC are female? So there's a real problem with women coming forward. Would he agree that we all have a role to play in encouraging suitably qualified women to put their names forward, not just to HOLAC but to all public bodies? And could he remind the House of how the government is doing against its target of 50% female appointments to public bodies? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I was reading yesterday the recently published UK Gender Sensitive Parliamentary Audit 2018, and it, made, and it made the point that the noble lady has just made. The applications that HOLAC received from men far exceed the number from women. And I agree that there is a role for uh, all of us in driving up the number of uh, uh, applications from uh, women. On her question about the specific percentage uh, of uh, senior appointments, perhaps I could write to the noble lady. In, encouraged greatly by Lord Young's suggestion that I um, ask the Government Chief Whip, Lord Taylor, for more time. Can I therefore ask him, please, for <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I may be in some trouble <laughs> with, with, my, with my noble friend, but that was actually in the brief that I got. <laughs> My Lords, as the last hereditary woman left standing, may I ask the Noble Lord to ask the Chief Whip to support the Noble Lord, Lord Grocott and Baroness Hader in their requests. Well, indeed, my, my noble friend, the Chief Whip, will have heard, heard both those bids and it will be discussed, discussed through the usual channels. My Lords, my Lords, my Lords, my Lords, my Lords, my Lords. My lords, my lords, my lords, diversity is one of the commonly asked questions. My lords, diversity is one of the commonly asked questions when we are speaking outside of this house, and it's an important issue for the public to know more about the membership of this house. And on approaching the library, it's surprising to learn that there's been no voluntary monitoring form sent out to members to collate information on other protected characteristics, geographical diversity, educational and employment backgrounds. So could I ask my noble friend, the Minister, to please ask the House authorities, as the staff do this, to send out a comprehensive monitoring form so we can tell the public more about who we are? Um, I, I say to my noble friend, I think one of the recommendations in the report that I uh, referred to was that there should be more uh, monitoring. And I think also that would be relevant to the House of Lords Appointments Commission. They do produce an annual report which uh, describes their progress in making appointments. And it would certainly be up to them to include more details along the lines suggested by my noble friend. Lord Alton of Liverpool. My Lords, I beg leave to ask the question standing in my name on the order paper, and in so doing I should mention that I co-chair the all-party parliamentary group on Pakistan minorities. My Lords, in the last ten years the UK has given £2.6 billion in aid to Pakistan, targeted towards the poorest and most excluded, who are often from minorities. We promote minority rights from grassroots to the highest levels of government. UK aid to Pakistan is declining, but continues to focus on the poorest. Since 2011, UK aid has supported primary education for 10 million, 10 million children, skills training for almost 250,000 people, and microfinance loans for 6.6 .6 million people. Thanking the noble baroness for that reply and welcoming her to her new responsibilities. Is she able to intervene on behalf of Shagufta Khalsa, an illiterate woman from one of Pakistan's beleaguered minorities who now occupies Asia Bibi's cell in Multan and who, like her, has been sentenced to death for allegedly sending blasphemous texts in English? Uh, when two children are forced, my lords, to watch a lynch mob of 1,200 burn alive their parents, when no one is brought to justice, for the murder of Shabazz Bhatti, 
Pakistan's Minister for Minorities, when a thousand Hindu and Christian girls are forcibly married and converted, and when minorities are ghettoised into squalid colonies which I visited and forced to clean latrines and sweep streets, isn't it time that DFID re-examined its policy of refusing to specifically direct any of the £383,000, which on average we give every single day to Pakistan in aid, for the alleviation of the suffering and destitution of these desperate minorities. I pay tribute to the Noble Lord's long-standing um, involvement on this important issue. Uh, we remain deeply concerned by the misuse of blasphemy laws and the treatment of minority religious communities in Pakistan. We regularly raise our concerns about the misuse of blasphemy laws and indeed the protection of minority communities uh, with the Government of Pakistan at a senior level. Um, I share the Noble Lord's desire to ensure that our international aid funding reaches those who most need it. Um, Currently, uh, many Pakistanis are reluctant to declare themselves as a member of a religious minority because of fear of discrimination. But we are working to address um, the issue of ensuring that we understand where our aid is going uh, and can reassure the Noble Lord we continually keep our programmes under review and where we can better prioritise resources, we will do. Uh, through the Conflict uh, Stability and Security Fund, ODA money funds the Capri programme in Pakistan. Whilst its aim is to increase Pakistan's capacity to investigate, detain and prosecute suspected terrorists, its definition of terrorism is incredibly wide and it has also resulted in torture and 195 death sentences. Will the noble lady, the minister, ask her department to investigate whether the Capri project supported by the CSSF could be supporting such human rights abuses? And will she commit to publishing the Overseas Security and Justice Assistance Assessment that led to this project being signed off by a minister? Um, as the Noble Lord will be aware, we, the Government opposes death penalty in all circumstances. We will continue to ensure that our position on that is made clear in all our, all our dealings with partner governments. I'm afraid I'm not aware of the specific project which the Noble Lord raises, but I will certainly uh, go back to the Department and write to him in detail. My Lord, the treatment... White stripe on the Pakistan flag signifies yeah, the yeah, rights yeah. of religious minorities. Yeah, yeah. But today Pakistan has strayed a long way from the ideals of its founder Muhammad Ali Jinnah and the heinous blasphemy laws are feared with good reason by those same minority groups that he sought to protect. So could I ask the noble lady, the minister, and may I welcome her to her new role here at the same time, uh, what safeguards does DFID put in place to ensure that religious minorities are at the very least not discriminated against in accessing and benefiting from DFID programmes? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, my Lords, I mentioned uh, our, our response to the blasphemy laws uh, in, in my previous answer. Um, we must continue to, to stand up for human rights and the freedom of religion and belief. Um, and uh, the Prime Minister has appointed my noble friend, uh, Lord Ahmed, uh, as special envoy on that issue. And uh, he regularly raises this issue and did so recently in February. My Lords, the treatment of minorities in Pakistan particularly Christians, not only infringes the UN Declaration of Human Rights, but ironically also the clear teachings of the Quran, which says that people of the book, that is Christians and Jews, should be allowed to be, uh, practice their religion unhindered. Despite this, members of the Christian community have been murdered and placed on death row for years on end for professing their faith and that some Christian women and young girls, it is now reported, are being sold into slavery in China and also used for the harvesting of organs. With this in mind, would the noble Lord agree that we should now look to the targeting of our aid yeah, and yeah. also moving for Pakistan to be expelled, not for the first time, from the Commonwealth? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. 
Um, my Lords, I certainly agree that we do need to ensure that uh, our international aid does reach those people who need it most. Uh, to that extent, we, the Foreign Secretary has commissioned an independent report to fully understand the full scope of the issue, and the Bishop of Truro will be writing uh, recommendations on how we can better address this issue. My Lords, uh, I, understood, I understood that uh, human rights uh, practice in the country in question was a factor in the uh, allocation of um, aid from us. My Lords, I, I think it's clear that in Pakistan, uh, the freedom of religion means that if you have a certain faith, you're apt to face the death penalty, which doesn't strike me as uh, in a conformity with the human rights on freedom of religion. Yes. Um, my Lords, um, as I said before, uh, my department and indeed the Foreign Office work very closely uh, to ensure that we are able to protect minority um, communities within Pakistan. We have seen some progress and we do welcome the commitments made by Prime Minister Khan to improve inclusion and transparency and to set Pakistan on a path to greater self-reliance. We have seen positive steps so far, including progress made on child marriage, passing the Child Marriage Restraint Act and indeed the issuing of visas to allow Indian Sikhs to make pilgrimage to Pakistan. There are other commitments, including the creation of a Commission on Minorities and the Christian Divorce Bill, where we will continue to support the Government to implement those policies. Baroness Armstrong of Hilltop. My Lords, I uh, seek permission to ask a question standing in my name on the order. My Lords, uh, this Government is committed to ensuring that as many families as possible can access high-quality, affordable childcare. That is why we are investing around £3.5 billion in our early education entitlements this year alone, more than any previous government. We monitor the provider market constantly through a range of regular and one-off research projects, which are ongoing and have already been published. Uh, my Lords, firstly, can I apologise? The question did not appear on the order paper in the manner I thought in my head I'd asked it, and I'm just not sure what happened. I didn't look until last night to see the actual an the question, because I was actually at wanting to ask about children in care rather than just childcare. So I apologise to the House and to the Minister. Children in care, the numbers are higher than ever before, and they're rising every year. The money in order to uh, look after them is reducing going to local government, which means the local government is now spending a very high proportion of its money allocated to children in the care system and not on early prevention and so on. This is now a crisis. We continue to see the most vulnerable children ending up more likely to be in the criminal justice system than in university on leaving care. The system is broken. The state is not proving to be a good parent. Will the government take hold of this and make sure that they have a proper look at our whole system? It is broken. It's not working, and the government really needs to change the way it looks after the most vulnerable children. Well, let me uh, focus on the subject of social care, um, as the noble baroness has raised it, because where a child cannot live at home, it is one of the state's most important responsibilities to ensure that they are kept safe and that they flourish. And that is why we have set out a far-reaching programme of reform in children's social care improving practice in local authorities, strengthening the social care workforce and supporting care leavers through staying put. And since 2010, 44 councils have been lifted out of failure and have not returned. So we think that rather than establish a new review, our priority is to embed these reforms as, we sta as they stand. One of the most uh, natural uh, results of ordinary parenthood is a bond between the parent and child which is of immense importance. Uh, I've tried on a number of occasions to secure something of the kind in the child care system that the noble Baroness meant to talk about, because I think it's vitally important. It's difficult for management, I understand that, but still, the aim should be to secure that, because I think it would make a terrific difference to the outcomes for most of those who are in that system. <coughs> 
My noble friend uh, is right, and the government believes that good early years education <laughs> is the cornerstone of social mobility and that um, children should be allowed to bond with their parents, but equally that um, parents should be allowed to, uh, to work. So that is why we have got the 15 hours uh, free entitlement and also the 30 hours for those uh, in work. But it's still the case that 28% of children finish their reception year still without the early communication and reading skills that they need to thrive. So there is more work to do, my Lord. So, my Lord, some years ago I was on a select committee for affordable childcare. We had many uh, excellent witnesses, including parents' organisations, and we reached some interesting conclusions. And one of them was that the system itself was so complex that parents found it difficult to understand what their rights were, and therefore some parents were not using it as, as they might. Could the noble lord say what is being done about simplifying the system of childcare so everyone understands it, everyone can benefit, children and parents alike? Well, we do not believe the system is too complicated. However, um, I should point out that parents can find information about all of the government's childcare offers uh, on the website, and I can give the noble baroness some details on that. We also have a childcare calculator that parents can use to check their eligibility for support. But can I also say that perhaps the, uh, the proof is in the pudding, as it were, because there is near universal take-up of the 15 hours for all three- and four-year-olds. That's 92% of three-year-olds and 95% of four-year-olds. And 72% of eligible two-year-olds are taking up their entitlement. So there is something that does work. Is my noble friend able to update the House on the progress of the schemes supported by the government? Uh, through which uh, children in care can secure places in state and independent boarding schools <laughs> where the child is suited to such an education? Uh, well, I can to the extent that uh, the uh, onus on this is uh, with the local authorities, and our position is that local authorities are best placed to target uh, spending and set their budgets, but also more the point is to uh, work out where uh, children in care might be best uh, placed in the local area. My Lord, let me try and blend the two questions. Nine years ago this month, the coalition government in the first round of austerity measures dealt a mortal blow to the Sure Start programme. Although Sure Start is more than childcare and more than healthcare, the IFS report recently issued demonstrates its value unequivocally in terms of its health outcomes, surely reinvesting in the original local Sure Start programmes would ensure that children were properly nurtured, that parents were engaged in parenting programmes that would stop children being taken into care in the first place. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I know that the uh, party opposite uh, feels um, very strongly about the Sure Start programme, and I very much note uh, the recent report that came out from the IFS. And, uh, and particularly focusing on the health uh, effects of Sure Start. But it also shows that the report um, demonstrates that children in disadvantaged areas benefit most from the services, and the policy framework that we have in place reflects this evidence. And can I say also that there are more children's mm -hmm. centres now than prior to 2008, and during the period when Tony Blair was PM? Baroness Cox. My Lord, I beg leave to ask a question standing in my name on the order paper. My Lords, we condemn the violent attacks by the Sudanese security forces against peaceful protesters in Sudan this week, which left many civilians dead or injured. The Transitional Military Council bears full responsibility. The United Kingdom calls for the human rights of all Sudanese people to be respected, the resumption of the political process with the protesters and the opposition, and an agreed transfer of power to a civilian-led government, as demanded by the Sudanese people, in a swift, orderly and, indeed, peaceful manner. My Lord, in thanking the Noble Lord the Minister for his reply, may I ask if he is aware that, according to reliable sources in Sudan, the death toll this week from the crackdown on peaceful protesters is now well over 100. Men have been reportedly hacked with machetes and thrown into the Nile. Women were raped in front of their children. As one survivor said, it was a massacre. So may I ask the Noble Lord, given that the attacks against civilians continue outside Khartoum in at least 11 towns, what is Her Majesty's Government doing to support those valiant peaceful protesters? And what steps will the United Kingdom take 
to ensure the military junta is called to account? Well, first of all, I agree totally with the noble lady. I, I saw reports um, uh, over the last few days, particularly and again this morning, I got a full update about the situation. As you'll know, our embassy is not far from where the actual camp was set up, and she is quite right. Uh, right. There are reports coming through of the official toll from the military um, uh, authorities was 46, I believe, but certainly media reports indicate the number is more in line with what the noble lady raises. In terms of the UK representation, our ambassador on the ground, who I pay tribute to with his team, is in direct contact with the military authorities, but also in part answering her second question, is directly meeting with the leaders of the opposition, including the forces <coughs> for freedom of change, and we're working hand in glove with the Troika and indeed the African Union to ensure that those who are committing these crimes, including those involved with the Transitional Military Council, are held fully to account. My Lords, everyone uh, would have, you know, a few weeks ago had hoped that peace process would happen and that we would see uh, a transition. And of course, that hope has been dashed by the recent press reports. One recent press report, in fact, yesterday uh, in The Guardian, was that the US government has approached the Saudi government to influence the Sudanese military to hold back. Could I ask him whether we've been working with the US government to place that sort of pressure on the Saudis, who seem to be having a far greater role than most people realise? Again, the noble lord is quite right. He will recall that the Saudi Arabian government, along with the Emirati government, have offered up £3 billion in terms of assistance to Sudan. Of that money, about half a billion has been deposited. But he is quite right, and I can assure him that the US government is raising it with the Saudis, as we are. And in terms of working specifically with the US government, I had a conversation myself about uh, 10 days ago, in advance of the latest situation, with Ambassador Sam Brownback on the issues of freedom of religion, which is a key part of ensuring a new Sudan with full civilian, in full civilian government incorporated. And we continue to work closely with the uh, government of the United States, but also the Emirati and Saudi governments as well. So, civilians are being killed close by military headquarters by soldiers in uniform. Journalists are being expelled on the orders of men in uniform. Supplies are being looted by men in uniform. I think we're getting the message that the military leaders look more and more like the regime they claim they've overthrown. Yesterday, the Transitional Military Council arrested opposition leader Yasser Aman and are holding him in an unknown uh, uh, location. Surely, my Lord's action is now vital through the African Union suspending Sudan while condemning the massacre, through convening an emergency meeting with the UN Security Council to try and force Russia and China's hand, and by beginning a process to prevent the TMC from representing Sudan in the General Assembly and through insisting on the immediate release of Yasser Amman. Does the Minister agree that without these actions, words of remorse or regret or disapproval are merely feckless and expedient measures? I do agree with the Noble Lord, and I can assure him that in terms of the United Nations, both in the terms of the Security Council in New York, as well as the Human Rights Council in Geneva, the United Kingdom, as a penholder, is taking these responsibilities very seriously. I am in discussions with our ambassadors in both places to see what next steps we can bring to the fore. Indeed, on the Security Council, we are co-sponsors with uh, penholders with Germany, and we will continue with those discussions. The Troika is very focused on these issues, and as I said in response to an earlier uh, answer I gave, that we are impressing upon the Sudanese authorities, including the ambassador here in the United Kingdom, that there are all options are on the table, including looking at the current sanctions policy, but those who are culpable will be held to account. Would, would, my, uh, would my noble friend... Uh, 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 my Lords, I was in Khartoum in January, and can I um, also pay tribute to the Ambassador, whose um, communication social media, despite internet problems, has been superb. Um, but uh, the other country involved in this is Egypt, and Egypt seems to have a vested interest in not putting too much pressure upon Sudan. Can the Minister say anything about our conversations with Egypt? and its influence over events in Sudan. First of all, may I also put on record my thanks to the Right Reverend Prelate for his interventions in Sudan. And I know, and working with 
Her Majesty's Government. She was instrumental in opening up of Christian schools in terms of the restrictions that were being put on, and we are grateful in that role. And I'm sure he'll agree with me that the role of the different communities of Sudan have a key aspect, a key priority in terms of establishing the new Sudan. In terms of working with international partners, he mentioned Egypt. As I've said to the noble Lord Collins, we are also working with the likes of the Saudi Arabians and the Emiratis. What is required is intense international pressure to ensure that the civilian rule can be incorporated and come into place at the earliest opportunity. And we're working through the good offices of Africa, the African Union, where Egypt, again, has a key and pivotal role.